What's up, everybody, and welcome to the final podcast of the 2020 football season and the 2020 calendar year. We're recording this on New Year's Eve. Occupy Fantasy Football Podcast, Week 17 edition. I'm Brian Jester, co-founder and co-host here at Occupy Fantasy, joined as always by Chris Rooney, our NFL Daily Plug writer and my co-host here. Happy New Year's to you, Chris, and I would probably say happy end of 2020 to you. Yes, uh, I think we're all looking forward to moving on from calendar year 2020. Although I will say, Brian, despite uh, despite not bringing home you know the big prize, I have been following along your million dollar mission, which is available at Occupy Fantasy's Twitch channel and here on the YouTube channel as well. I think right, yep, yep. you've had a very successful 2020 NFL season, so congratulations to you, sir. Now let's talk about the final week of the 2020 NFL regular season which will allow us to hopefully get 2021 off to a strong start in DFS. Yeah, new tax year. So we got to get started on the right foot. We can't get ourselves in a hole to start the the, the 2021 <laughs> tax season. So, uh, yeah, so this Week 17 edition, a little bit different than normal. We'll start with the motivations for Week 17, which, team, which teams are playing for something, which teams we expect to rest starters. Then we'll go into our typical injury segment, which is pretty lengthy at this point. And I imagine, Chris, it will only – continue to grow uh, throughout the end of the week and through the weekend as teams rest their veterans and get a look at younger players. Uh, and then we'll talk about the high level view of the slate with the betting odds, the totals, game stacks we like, and then of course our underperforming receivers and tight ends to target for this just absolutely massive week 17 main slate, 15 games, right, Chris, for this, this main slate on Sunday. Yeah. Every single NFL team is in action this Sunday. No Island games until Sunday night. And that is the only game that is not available on the FanDuel and DraftKings main slate, which is the Washington football team versus the Philadelphia Eagles. So every single other offense is one we have to examine here. Yeah, exactly. So let's talk about these teams that are expected to actually play for something in week 17. So I'm just going to rattle these off. And Chris, if you have any thoughts or comments about the teams, uh, I'll let you finish up with it. So teams that are fighting for playoff spots in the AFC, we have Baltimore, Cleveland, Indianapolis, Miami, Tennessee. They're fighting for playoff spots. Uh, On the NFC side, we have Arizona, Chicago, and the Rams fighting for playoff spots. Green Bay, New Orleans, and Seattle are fighting for seeding at the top of the NFC leaderboard in the playoff picture. And then the NFC East, Dallas, Washington, and the Giants are somehow battling for a playoff spot uh, to win the division. Teams that have clinched, or if they're either in the playoffs and they can't move much, or they've clinched the one seed. Kansas City has clinched the number one seed. Pittsburgh and Buffalo are battling for two and three, but they're not expected to go all out. And then Tampa Bay, even though they're playing for a five seed, uh, not much to, to gain. Although, Chris, I guess uh, Bruce Arians said they're going to play it. They're going to try to win. And I guess when the prize is you get to play an NFC East team in the first round of the playoffs, I guess that's motivation to win. Say so the Buccaneers may actually be looking at this as a win to, I don't want to completely disrespect the NFC least here, but uh, it's a bye week basically for the Bucks. I think that's how they're treating it. If they can lock up that five seed, go on the road and hopefully have a, a subpar below 500 uh, opponent to play in the first round. Can't really ask for a better situation if you have to play a game on wildcard weekends. So um, the teams that I'm most interested in here, we will get to this. Well, you know what? Since we're already talking about it, why don't we get there? Um, I like the Tennessee Titans a lot this week, Brian. I also think we need to look at these teams that are fighting for playoff spots or seeding as the best opportunities for us to find our game stacks this week. And so the Titans are actually involved in one of those games, I think. Frankly, not just us. I think everybody will be on. It is that Tennessee and Houston Texans game, 56 and a half point total. I mean, that that's definitely something that's going to grab everybody's attention here. And these are two really good offenses. I know on the Houston side, right? I mean, they've been eliminated for a while, but Deshaun Watson and Brandon Cooks and, and last couple of weeks, David Johnson, like these guys have been balling out. So I do think that's one of the more popular games this week. And then uh, we were talking uh, yesterday a little bit, um, about the green Bay Packers and how they're chasing all sorts of like team individual records. And you've got Aaron Rodgers and Devonte Adams talking about these milestones they're trying to achieve. Sounds scary to me to fade either one of those guys on this slate when they're talking about trying to go out there and get records like, you know, 200 more receiving yards and two more touchdowns for Devonte Adams. Uh, Aaron Rodgers needs like three more touchdowns for, you know, a personal best or something like that. Like, um, and then on the other side, you know, I don't want to give 
any short shrift to Chicago, especially if our boy Lucas is losing, uh, listening, losing, right? Um, <laughs> the Bears need to need to win this game to get in the playoffs. I don't think that's going to happen, but we have Mitchell Vick, David Montgomery, Allen Robinson, uh, some really nice players on the Chicago side to help with a stack there. Those were the things, I know that was a lot, but those were the things that jumped out to me when looking at the motivations for these different teams here. Yeah, and in Green Bay, you can bet your ass that every single time they get inside the five-yard line, Rodgers is throwing this week to try to get those records. So, uh, yeah, yeah, good luck if you decide to fade that game. Before we get into the injuries and the impacts for the slate, Chris, I do want to ask you, you and I were both looking at just some historical data in Week 17 tournaments for FanDuel and DraftKings, uh, mm-hmm. high-scoring players at each position, and at least what we found in – in quarterbacks, it's mostly from teams fighting to play for something. It's mostly starters. It's not necessarily backups playing. But we will see some of these younger guys, role players, um, mm-hmm. these backup players mixed in into the running back receiver, mostly running backs and receivers, right? And I guess some tight ends, but most most tight ends um, also are on teams fighting for something. Yeah, we. I mean, it should come as no surprise. The positions that were the most variant that I believe we looked at were wide receiver, and then even more so tight end. And that makes sense because these are the positions with the widest range of outcomes. Uh, Dovetailing into something else I was looking at, you know, we, we always say, you know, you don't have to listen to or just read, you know, occupy content because we, we look at other stuff too. And uh, your old friends at number fire, Jim Sanes had a nice uh, article about a week 17 DFS on FanDuel over the last three seasons. Uh, I looked at perfect lineups over the last three years that would fit under the, the FanDuel salary cap. And it looks like about 60%, uh, 16 out of 26 players, uh, one year they had a kicker in there, so he excluded that, were from teams that were on, uh, or that were fighting for something, that had these motivations that we're talking about. So the vast majority of our player pools should absolutely come from all these teams we mentioned here at the top of the show, with a few exceptions that we can sprinkle in that are in some, I think, better situations for more guaranteed playing time, which we'll get into here in a few minutes. Yeah, absolutely. So good call there. Go check out Number Fire for that FanDuel article. Um, so th- players we know that are sitting this weekend, Big Ben for the Steelers and some of their defensive players are going to be sitting out this game. All of the Chiefs starters, Mahomes, uh, Le'Veon, if he was even healthy, Tyreek, Kelsey, Sammy Watkins, those guys are sitting. Uh, and then we have a couple other injury-related or off-the-field issues that are causing people to sit. So let's let's try to run through these injuries, Chris. Uh, the Rams, they're literally fighting for a playoff spot. And they're going to be without their starting quarterback. Maybe it's an, uh, an upgrade. I don't know. Two of their top two other uh, three running backs. And then one of their top two receivers. Um, tough time to see all these things happen. I meant to dig out my Arizona Hot Shots merchandise for John <laughs> Walford week, uh, Brian, but I just, you know, I kind of spaced out. Did not do that for the recording here. Yeah, the starting quarterback for the Rams here is John Walford. Uh, if for some reason, you're listening or watching this podcast and you're a fan of Wake Forest football. You know John Walford. He was a uh, quarterback there and, and played pretty well. Uh, turned that into a nice year i believe it's an eight game regular season with the arizona hot shots of the short-lived alliance of american football back in the spring of 2019 he actually ended up on the rams uh roster for that preseason uh, for those who were with us for preseason dfs in 2019 in august 2019 probably heard his name a few times because i'm a big fan of his if that makes sense um I do think that Walford has a chance to be successful here. The problem, of course, is going to be not having Cooper Cup especially out there. Uh, He's going to have to lean heavily on Robert Woods, uh, Josh Reynolds, and Van Jefferson as his main receivers. Gerald Everett, Tyler Higby still expected to be out there at tight end. Running back, though, here with the Rams is a real uh, interesting situation. On the one hand, we have, um, you know, Cam Akers and Darrell Henderson that are out, right? And so we should, we should see Malcolm Brown like just get this like old huge three down roll, get you know all the touches out of the backfield. But on the other hand, and I think that's what you were about to say, Brian, it's Sean McVay, and we yeah. never know what he's going to do, right? Right, exactly. But I, I do have to think, you know, a win and in scenario, they're not going to game plan in these other guys, right? I mean, Malcolm yeah. Brown's the guy who knows the system. With, we, we love the know the system guys here and NFL coaches definitely love the know the system guys so Brown I imagine is going to get a ton of work here um, he already ranks highly in the Occupy model he's pretty cheaply priced Chris I don't know if he's lock button territory just because of the the injuries around him but one of the best running back plays I would say in week 17 
Yeah, and the fact that the Rams are so dinged up, I mean, actually, I think the Cardinals are getting three points last I looked here, so I think that will keep me off of recommending Brown as a full lock button play, but we're going to have to find some value somewhere at running back, and he might be the best option for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, um, let's go to the uh, the NFC North. Matthew Stafford somehow still playing despite the team being out of the playoff chase. Uh, he hurt his ankle early last week. It doesn't sound like he's going to play. Uh, we'll see. He likes to tough it out. If he can't go, Chase Daniel will probably get the start. Let's keep an eye there. Um, not really much to talk about there from a fantasy perspective. The Minnesota Vikings, probably one of the biggest uh, news items of the Week 17 slate. Dalvin Cook will miss the game after his father unexpectedly passed away. We'll see if we get Alexander Madison back and cleared from his concussion. Uh, if not, it's Mike Boone and Amir Abdullah there. But uh, I'd have to think, if Madison's back, Chris, what are your thoughts there? Because he should get most of the work, I would imagine, even though he's missed the last couple of weeks. The thing that jumped out to me, and, and, and these teams are playing head-to-head Detroit and Minnesota, is the fact that this game has a 54-point total right now, but like all the main players seem to be out yeah. other than... Uh, Kirk Cousins, Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen. So I don't really understand why that, I mean, well, I think I can kind of glean or or guess it's uh, Detroit. Last time we saw them against the Bucks, they just didn't even (laughs) seem like they were trying on defense, which might be a problem uh, against guys like Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen. Uh, Kirk Cousins, you know, I know we kind of waffle back and forth on, on how we feel about this guy, but from a DFS perspective, he's been a pretty reliable quarterback all year. This has been a pretty productive offense all year. It's been a high ceiling offense. That's why we've talked about Minnesota as a game stack all season. I don't know if I trust it here just because neither team really has much to play for, but I could absolutely see a scenario where Minnesota just erupts and wins this game like, you know, like 42 to 14 or something like that, just because the Lions are just not trying at all. Absolutely could see yeah. something like that, especially yeah. with all the guys they have on their side of the ball that we'd want to target in DFS. Um, some other yeah. running backs to monitor here. Chase Edmonds uh, left last week's game with a hip injury. Um, didn't practice as of Wednesday, We're recording this early Thursday. Uh, but the dude has been healing like Wolverine, hasn't missed a game this year despite some ankle in- injuries and doubtful tags. And uh, we'll see. If, if he's out, Kenyon Drake did handle most of the touches last week, 20 out of 23, in a must-win game now. Uh, this week. And then James Robinson, who has been a great DFS player most of the year, he's out. He's been shut down with the dreaded high ankle sprain. Uh, But Agumba Wale, I think surprisingly, at least surprising to most people, actually got a majority of the touches in Jacksonville's backfield last week. Yeah, so this is where the true uh, DFS grinders really shine here. Week 17 DFS, looking at a one-win football team in the Jacksonville Jaguars. And we can tell you that Agumba Wale had 14 out of 16 running back carries last week. Five targets, 71% of the snaps in the first game that they had without James Robinson available. Before week 16, Brian, there wasn't a single running back on Jacksonville's roster that had double digit touches, like on the whole year. So, feels like Ogumba Wally is probably a lock to get that again here in week 17 against the Colts. The issues with this are, are twofold. One, Jacksonville is really bad. That's why they only have one win. And then the Colts run defense is excellent. So um, really they're what, the only they're, they're what, like 14 point underdogs too, right? Yeah. So the, the only reason we're really looking at this is because we probably can quote unquote guarantee the touch floor there for a gun And if for some reason you're looking to stack this game, which it does have a decent total, I think it's like 49 and a half points right now. He might be one of the more reliable pieces on this offense, especially considering over the last couple of weeks, you and I have both watched Jacksonville pretty closely and we've been frustrated by how often they seem to run the football despite being down by outrageous margins. So if they're going to continue to do that, Ogumbo Ali might be the best player on Jacksonville to use this week. True test of character, watching Jacksonville games this late in the season, right? you got to love the life of, of playing DFS. Absolutely. Uh, let's talk about the San Francisco 49ers for a second. Uh, Brandon Ayuk, one of your favorite plays all year, been a fantastic rookie. Uh, he has an ankle injury. He's going to be out. Um, Debo Samuels remains out with his, his hamstring injury. So it looks like we have Richie James and Kendrick Bourne as the top two receivers here. Obviously, George Kittle is still going to be the tight end one here, but some cheap volume at receiver never hurt anybody in DFS tournaments. 17, they're all division games, but San Francisco, Seattle always play each other tough. Uh, this was a, a San Francisco offense that actually had a pretty nice day against the Cardinals last Saturday, I believe. So, uh, you know, we got CJ Beathard at quarterback. Jeff Wilson looks due to be the main running back again with Raheem Mostert on IR. 
Tevin Coleman apparently still just battling tired legs right in the off season for us. Uh, not Tevin Coleman, Jarek McKinnon, Ter- Tevin Coleman's just not getting work. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we can use these two guys here. Uh, Richard James, especially we've seen him erupt Kendrick Bourne, uh, the, the bane of my existence in DFS, uh, you know, never play this guy, but he seems to always find his way into some high scoring, uh, DFS lineups. You know, I mentioned, uh, or we both mentioned, I should say, at the top of the show, avoiding these teams that have nothing to play for. Kyle Shanahan strikes me as one of these guys that just treats every single game like an opportunity to prove that they belong in this league, regardless of what their record is. Um, So I I do think that San Francisco is going to come out and try to beat the Seahawks here on Sunday. I wouldn't mind mixing Jeff Wilson, especially, into some high-risk allocation, just because every single time, Brian, you and I talk about this, talked about this the other day, um, Jeff Wilson seems to just erupt every single time he gets three down work. Dude, like it, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> He's a beast, man. He's a beast and a great fit for this system too. I mean, it's Shanahan's system plug and play too, right? You can put almost any running back back there and they're putting up, putting up numbers and uh, Jeff Wilson looks to be the next in line to do that. Had a big game last week. I'm sure we'll like him again this week. Once the daily plug comes out on Friday. Um, all right, a couple other injuries to talk about here. Michael Pittman for the Colts. Dealing with concussion. We'll see if he's activated or clears the concussion protocol before Friday. If not, T.Y. Hilton, Zach Pascal will get some bumps in their expectations. Cole Beasley dealing with some sort of leg injury. They said he's week to week, which is never a great estimation uh, when you hear that from the coach on Wednesday. So we'll see if he can even get back for the playoffs, given whatever his injury is. Uh, and then on Sunday night football, not on the main slate, but Terry McLaurin still dealing with his ankle injury. Uh, Chris, thoughts on the Beasley situation? Um, and if you're playing the showdown slate, guys that would benefit if uh, Scary Terry's out once again. Yeah, well, this just starting with Buffalo and Cole Beasley, I guess this is a, a nice segue and a good opportunity for us to say, just because this is the final podcast of the NFL season, we will still have NFL content for you throughout the playoffs. Obviously, Buffalo, a team that we're going to be looking at at least next week. Um, and it sounds like Buffalo actually is looking at bringing in Kenny Stills for a workout, which, Brian, that does not speak well for how uh, injured Cole Beasley is right. I mean, that, that makes it sound like it's serious. If they're looking to bring in a veteran for the playoff run here, um, without Cole Beasley out there, I think, uh, you've got the, he hit the nail on the head here. It looks like Isaiah McKenzie will probably get more of the slot work here in the short term. I'm most interested in what happens with Gabriel Davis though. They're, uh, rookie wide receiver. All these rookies are really no longer rookies anymore. They've played a full season, right. but uh, Gabriel Davis has had a very phenomenal year for them. He's actually running a route on virtually all of Josh Allen's dropbacks over the last few weeks um, without John Brown out there. So we'll see if they can actually get him back for the playoffs. That might actually help mitigate some of the Cole Beasley uh, injury issues there all year with the Colts kind of switching over to that here. We have been advocating for kind of avoiding stacking the Colts because it's just they use too many players. It's really hard for us to find concentrated volume. If Michael Pittman misses time, misses this week 17 game, and, and if the Colts you know make it to the postseason and we're playing showdown and short slates here, it makes it easier for us to figure out who we want on the Colts offense. T.Y. Hilton and Zach Paschal seem to be the main guys at wide receiver. And I know he wasn't on your list here, but it actually looks like Jack Doyle is seeing a little bit more attention now in the passing game for the Colts here. So uh, vet, I think he is the veteran at tight end in uh, in Indianapolis now. Makes uh, complete sense to me that now that they're getting into must-win territory, end of the year, they're leaning on their veterans, the guys that they trust here. That makes sense. And yeah, and when you have these teams that have a lot of mouths to feed and they generally spread the ball out, Honestly, just one injury or absence could shrink that pie a little bit more and, and make these make these guys uh, a little more viable at their price points on both sides. So just something to keep in mind. And again, that's going to happen over the next couple of days as we head towards Sunday. Veterans and other guys are going to be removed from the offense for rest, minor injuries, uh, mm-hmm. and it really could blow up the potential for a lot of their teammates. So keep that in mind. Chris, let's move ahead to the, the overview, the high-level look at the Week 17 slate, the betting markets. One thing I'll say before we get into it, monitor these closely. The line moves will tell us a lot of what we need to know about who's playing and who's not playing uh, over the next couple of days. We'll see big moves on the spread, big moves on the total, and that'll let us know that these starters are probably going to sit or they're resting a lot of their main players, whatever it may be. So keep in mind, again, this is two, uh, Thursday afternoon we're recording this. Uh, these spreads may change big time. So the biggest spreads, Chris, we already talked about the Colts, 14-point favorites over the Jags. 
The Ravens are 13-point favorites over the Bengals. Cleveland, 10.5-point favorites over the Steelers, which would not be the case if they were playing their, their regular starters, right? Titans, 7.5-point favorites. Saints, 7-point favorites. Tampa Bay, 7-point favorites. What sticks out to you? Well, uh, you hit the nail on the head introducing this section. Cleveland favored by 10.5. I actually kind of looked at this already. That line opened at just six and a half. But as soon as we found out, you know, they're going to rest Ben Roethlisberger. They're going to rest TJ Watt, uh, Cam Hayward, you know, a bunch of key players on their kind of starting lineup on both sides of the ball. They got a four point bump in the betting markets here on the spread. So probably a good indication Pittsburgh's not trying at all here on Sunday. The other one, even though um, we're not necessarily worried about this, I don't think this week, but if you needed any more reassurance that the Kansas City Chiefs were not going to be trying here in Week 17, um, it, it looks like the Chargers are now three and a half point favorites against the Chiefs, which would definitely not be the case <laughs> if uh, if Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, Tyreek Hill, you know, all these guys were going to play. So uh, don't think we talked much about Kansas City yet in this episode. I'm kind of recommending, and I, I feel like you agree just cross them out unless we can get some kind of news, you know, like randomly that like Darwin Thompson at running back at like min price is going to play, you know, hundred percent of the snaps. Like unless we find that out, we're probably not going to be playing any Kansas city guys here. The running backs that I'm most interested in on this slate should be no surprise that since the Colts are 14 points, two touchdown favorites, we want to get some exposure to Jonathan Taylor here, Brian, he has been, playing a much larger role over the last few weeks, and especially in positive game scripts. You know, when they're favored by this many points over Jacksonville, it should be a positive game script for Jonathan Taylor. I think he's pretty much going to be the... I, I don't know what the model says just yet. I haven't looked, but I would guess Jonathan Taylor is going to be amongst the highest on running backs on this slate since his salary is not as high as some of the other guys on this list we're about to talk about. Derrick Henry and Alvin Kamara, both getting, you know, a touchdown in their respective games as favorites in spots where they need to win. So um, those are the main three for me on contenders, Jonathan Taylor, Derrick Henry, and Alvin Kamara. You could make a case, maybe you will, for J.K. Dobbins with Baltimore, but I just, you know, when we have a large slate like this, I like to pick from teams where I'm not worried about the quarterback taking away from the running back volume. And then uh, with the Cleveland Browns, the other big favorite here, it's just kind of the, the dreaded two-headed monster syndrome. You know, we have been kind of dealing with this all year. Is it going to be Nick Chubb or Kareem Hunt? Is it going to be both? Um, it's been very difficult to nail down which Browns running back is going to be the monster week to week. Yeah, exactly. Lots of good points there, Chris. And I, I'll say we had a similar situation with the Chiefs, um, with the Saints a couple of years ago, where Saints were resting their starters in week 17. And generally, we're not really targeting players from this game. Maybe we'll get a min price receiver for making a bunch of lineups. Uh, rarely are we targeting the quarterback. But pretty late in the week that year, I think it was 2018, uh, they decided they were going to rest all of their running backs. And it was just Dwayne Washington, normally a special teams guy. He was going to get all the work. And he was 3K, going to play every snap. And uh, he became pretty popular, and I think he rushed for 100 yards in that game. So, yeah, if we get something like that on a, on a team that, uh, one, already has a good offensive scheme, like the Chiefs, like that definitely helps. Obviously, Mahomes isn't running it, but when you have a fantasy-friendly scheme, that certainly helps. Um, if something happened and it's like this one running back is the only guy going to get touches, yeah, then we'll look and add those guys on these teams resting their starters. Uh, but other than that, we probably won't be targeting too many players from those teams. Uh, Chris, highest totals of the week. We hit it on a couple of these earlier, but Tennessee and Houston, 56 and a half. Minnesota, Detroit, 54. Green Bay and Chicago, 51. Vegas and the Broncos, 51. Atlanta and Tampa Bay, 50. Jacksonville and Indy, 49 and a half. And a couple of these teams scattered through the highest team totals of the week. Uh, we've been doing this lately, so Miles, we will talk about some of your favorite game stacks. Do they line up with some of these higher total games? Yeah, I mean, Tennessee and Houston and Green Bay and Chicago are the two games. And I think that that's probably all I'm going to recommend this week it is just the two games to concentrate on. I'm kind of leaning towards just looking towards stacking like offenses that we feel like are going to perform because they need to rather than like fully stacking both sides of the game. And so the three other offenses that I'm looking at, uh, you know, let me know what you think, obviously, 
I like the Colts this week against Jacksonville. It's hard not to. I mean, Jacksonville's defense is pretty bad. Uh, we've got Baltimore, who needs to go all out to win against the Bengals. So should be pretty easy for us to, to jam them into our lineups with some of the cheap plays we've already talked about. And then the Cleveland Browns, playing against a Pittsburgh Steelers defense that doesn't seem to be super interested in, in winning this game. Those are three offenses that probably will be worth, you know, trying a three-man stack um, in addition to those two game stacks. Yeah, love that idea. We, we talked about it, I think, briefly last week on the podcast where you don't have to stack three games. You don't need full games to stack. When we have big big spreads and one-sided offenses, we can easily just stack one side of a game. Uh, and this looks like it may be a week to do it, especially with so many divisional matchups. Literally all of them are divisional matchups. So a um, lot to think about there. And again, Chris is going to finalize all these thoughts in the Daily Plug. Friday, the final, main, or the final regular season Daily Plug. Uh, we'll have daily plugs throughout the playoffs as well. So keep tuned, OccupyFantasy.com for that. Chris, sad face here. The last underperforming receivers list of the year has treated us pretty well all season. Um, of course, we couldn't get out of here with the last slate of the year without getting Brashad Perriman on the list. But other guys, interesting names, Darius Slayton, Jerry Judy, and Gabriel Davis is potentially interesting to me with Beasley out. Maybe they rest digs a little bit. John Brown probably not going to be there. So a big opportunity for Gabriel Davis. Uh, and then DJ Chark does round out the list, but we have to monitor him because he left that game late with a knee injury or a shin injury. Didn't practice Wednesday. Uh, if he doesn't play, uh, they don't have tons of reasons to play Chris Conley. So, <laughs> Yeah, so Buffalo, as of right now, this isn't precluding them from making any moves like activating John Brown or signing somebody. Although this late in the week, they, the only resource they can sign from to the active roster is the practice squad due to the COVID regulations. I was going to say they only have uh, five receivers on the active roster right now, one of which is Beasley. So we're pretty confident he's not going to play. Stefan Diggs, they probably want to keep him, you know, in good shape for a playoff game. This game against the Dolphins doesn't really mean much for them. They've got Andre Roberts, who's mostly just a special teams guy. And that leaves Isaiah McKenzie and Gabriel Davis as the only other real receivers who mix in on off on offensive snaps for them. If they're going to go with some of their second string guys for the majority of this game against uh, the Dolphins, it's as much as I want to say, I find uh, Davis to be one of their more valuable assets. So maybe he'll get rested. The reason I'm talking about this right now is because it doesn't feel like they have the luxury of actually being able to do that. Right. So Gabriel Davis is probably going to get a significant amount of run. A very, very cheap receiver here. Um, Against the Dolphins defense, which isn't necessarily the most difficult matchup. i uh, love to check things live on the show and see if it changes our, our, our takes on the fly for you. It's an average pass uh, defense, uh, 13th DVOA. Not that that really is going to stop us from trying to get somebody who's going to play for at least part of the game with Josh Allen, who has been playing at such an incredible, incredible level this year. Yeah, I mean, um, you yeah. had some other receivers here we can talk about. I don't want to make this just the uh, Gabriel Davis show before we wrap it up for the year here. You are desperately trying to make not just me, all of the listeners here start 2021 off on a terrible note with Jerry Judy and Brashad Perriman. Can we really do this? I mean, I don't know if I can. I'm, I'm ready to, you know, my New Year's resolution to you, Brian, is I think I'm ready to just not play wide receivers on legit bad football teams anymore. Like I'm, I'm very much over it at this point. I don't know. How, I don't know how you're feeling about these two guys right now. I think it's fair. I think it's fair. And you know what? Late in the year, we can play Jerry Judy. We can play Brashad Perriman. And it's like, ah, uh, we're just making tax write-offs. It's fine. Right. We can't make that excuse January 1st. Right. And we're trying to play these yeah. guys and starting a hole. So again, Jerry Judy, I mean, We've seen the issues all year, whether it's in, inaccurate quarterback play, not being targeted. Then last week, he set a record for drops over like the last five years. He had five drops in a single game. Was getting wide open. Getting open is what we care about the most in fantasy football. Yeah. Getting open, you're going to get targeted eventually, and eventually you're going to catch the ball. We have a, a week with the Denver Broncos, Brian, where, uh, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but we've been chasing Jerry Judy all year. And last week we finally decided we're going to go with the running game because that's what they like to do. We go uh, and target Melvin Gordon, low risk, high risk, because Philip Lindsay is out. And then Jerry Judy gets 15 targets. Dude, listen, 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 <laughs> listen. We played Broncos passing game all year. They're, they love running the ball. I've never seen a team pass more in my life last week. They were, it doesn't matter what the game script was. Drew Locke was back, dropping back the pass every single time. Uh, it was I, I couldn't have been more tilted. So we're going to go back to him this week. Just expect 25 to 75 carries for whoever they put in the backfield. 
Yep. It's unbelievable. Uh, we haven't spent any time on him really while we're kind of both just laughing about our misfortunes here a little bit. Uh, Darius Slayton is playing for the New York Giants in a game that matters. Uh, the Giants need to win and they need some help on Sunday Night Football to get into the postseason as the NFC East champions. So on this list, you know, the five guys you mentioned, Darius Slayton, Jerry Judy, Gabriel Davis, Brashad Perriman, and DJ Chark. Slayton and Gabriel Davis are probably the best plays here for week 17. If you want to focus on just those two guys out of the underperforming pool, I'm not going to blame anybody that's listening for doing so this week. Yeah, I think that makes a ton of sense. You know, Darius Slayton is at the top of the list, by the way. For those who can't see it, it'll be in the plug, uh, sorted in order by relative underperformance. And and Slayton does top the list as the best underperforming receiver play. Um, getting tons of deep targets. Hopefully Daniel Jones can hit him this week against the Cowboys. All right, Chris, let's round out the final episode of 2020 uh, with your favorite tight ends to target. And I'm kind of sad because it's the last tight end segment of the last episode of the season. And we can't even talk about Logan Thomas, who in a miraculous turnaround finished as like a top five fantasy tight end this year. Yeah, it's, it's uh, again, I think we talked about this a little bit last week. That is why we look at this data, routes run, snaps, you know, all that stuff. When guys aren't necessarily getting the volume like Thomas was for the majority of the season here, just because they're out, they're, they're out on the field, so that means they have a chance to have that materialize as the year marches on. He's had, you know, not be- before we move on from Logan Thomas, Brian, he's had double-digit targets in two consecutive games. If Scary Terry is going to be out on Sunday Night Football, we can probably end the regular season strong, the 256th game of the year, with some Logan Thomas captain lineups on DraftKings Showdown. What I wouldn't have world, it. Right? I would have it another way. That's the only way to end this year. Tight um, ends this week. We're gonna probably just stick to the most obvious ones to play. To me, the best one on the slate is Mark Andrews. Again, Baltimore needs to win this game to get in the postseason. He's actually their their top receiver, uh, including Hollywood Brown. Like he actually gets more targets overall in this offense. Seems to have more of a focus from Lamar Jackson. So definitely think Mark Andrews is in play. Uh, 5,800 DraftKings, 7,200. Pardon me, 7,200 on FanDuel. Evan Engram, who was on our underperforming wide receiver list last week, got 10 targets in that game for the Giants. Uh, facing the Dallas Cowboys in that must-win game for the Giants alongside his his buddy Darius Slayton. Dallas just 29th on the year defending tight ends. I kind of think Evan Ingram is probably the best value tight end this week for that reason. Austin Hooper uh, with the Browns. It's literally the toughest matchup for a tight end if Pittsburgh was playing all their starters, and we know that they are not. So Austin Hooper in a must-win game for the Browns. We actually just found out today uh, Harrison Bryant uh, is on the COVID restricted list. Actually, I think he might have already been on the list, but we found out again he's still going to be for week 17. Um, so Austin Hooper probably locked in for the highest floor role at tight end. Don't expect him to get as many targets as he got last week against the Jets, though. It looks like the Browns are getting all of their main wide receivers back for this must win game. But if you're looking to kind of stick to quote unquote the best plays at tight end this week, I think it's Mark Andrews, Evan Engram, Austin Hooper. I cannot let you end this show and end our podcast regular season, Brian, without mentioning two players. One, my favorite player at the tight end position in the entire league. No, it's not Logan Thomas. It's Mike Gesicki with the Miami Dolphins. Uh, Again, Buffalo may not be trying in this game. Uh, Miami without Jakeem Grant. Devontae Parker has been out the last couple weeks, and I think he's on the wrong side of questionable, potentially again here in week 17. Gesicki might be you know, the top receiver for the Dolphins here in a must-win game. So that could be interesting. And then the XFL legend, Donald Parham. He let us down last week, Brian, but he still ran over, uh, yeah, like 78%, uh, ran around on 78% of Justin Herbert's dropbacks, playing against Kansas City defense that probably isn't going to be, um, you know, it's not going to have a lot of their starters featured for the majority of the game. So Parham might be interesting here as well. Yeah, he uh, it might be a little flashback for him playing against some XFL quality defenders against the KC backups. So, yeah, Hunter Henry, we'll see if he if he comes back this week. But if not, fire, fire up the XFL legend. So, uh, Chris, I want to say it's been a pleasure doing this with you every single week of this season. I learned a lot from you. Hopefully our viewers and listeners have learned a lot as well. Again, we're not going anywhere. OccupyFantasy.com. Chris, are you still going to do periscopes on Sunday mornings or that is that a regular season ending as well? 
Well, uh, I'll do a, a, a Periscope for you for week 17 here. Um, Periscope as a service being discontinued in March. So I think we're going to have to figure out something for the future there. But, you know, I think you and I will put our heads together. We'll figure out what the NFL postseason content is going to look like. I'm definitely down to do whatever it takes to help uh, our members, subscribers, viewers, listeners uh fans whatever right continue to have a profitable nfl dfs experience through the beginning of february yes and a final reminder week 17 is our final members only free roll contest on DraftKings. the link is in the daily plug at occupyfantasy.com it's free to enter the winner the most points gets a free 100 dollars DraftKings ticket for the following week's slate and in the wild card round we're inviting the winner of all 17 weeks to compete in a special contest where the winner is going to get some very special prizes. So we've already had 16 winners. You can be the 17th if you go to, and it's free to play the members only free roll, occupyfantasy.com, the NFL daily plug in the contest selection section, you'll see the link. So go do it. It's free. Always play free rolls. So mm. thanks to everyone for listening this entire season. We appreciate it more than, you know, give us a thumbs up. Final thumbs up if you're watching this. Go subscribe in your podcast apps and on YouTube. Maybe we'll have some all-season content for you as well. Maybe some different sports. Subscribe so you don't miss it. For Chris, I'm Brian, Occupy Fantasy. Thanks again for listening. Good luck in week 17. And if we don't talk to you soon, we'll talk to you week one of 2021.